So welcome to our lecture on numerical methods. And uh, we are in the middle of discussing the Monte Carlo method. And uh, what we did in the last session was introduce Monte Carlo integration. So the expectation is um, an integral. We finished this session on Monte Carlo integration. Uh, maybe the most important result was our convergence estimate. So our Monte Carlo sum. So if we consider the application of Monte Carlo integration deviates from the expectation. So in this case, the integral Okay, if we take a look at this, then uh, we can have some error bound. Yeah, so and our error bound was here, sigma, which is somehow the variance of f of x, where x is uniform, square root of the variance, so sigma squared is the variance, divided by the square root of some delta, divided by the square root of n. Okay, and the probability that we are within this bound, which we can make tighter by increasing n, this probability is larger than one minus delta. Okay, that was maybe our most important uh, result here on the Monte Carlo integration. Yeah, so what I'd like to do uh, today with you is to get to discuss more the intuition behind this approach. Yeah? So why is actually the Monte Carlo integration um, working the way it works and where does the advantage come from? And actually what I also like to, to uh, um, illustrate is that the fact that we have a probabilistic error estimate, which is disappointing a bit. Yeah, So we do not really know if our um, approximation works. Um, it's actually not a bug, it's a feature. Okay, and to do this, I compare it again to the classical integration rule like uh, Simpson's rule. So let's start uh, with this. So we have more uh, uh, on intuition, yeah? but I believe actually getting the right intuition for the method is maybe the most important part. So the first observation we make, yeah, so which is an advantage of the Monte Carlo method is that um, you can use uh, actually an additional Monte Carlo integration to increase the accuracy. Yeah? So there's some kind of additivity between two approximations. Yeah? Two smaller approximations can be combined to get a better approximation. So uh, let me let me maybe write this down. Yeah. So if you have, say, for example, one Monte Carlo integration i one. Yeah. So with n one numbers. So I have i from one to n one uh, using a sequence which I call say x superscript one. Yeah? And then I have another Monte Carlo integration i two. So using n2 numbers with another sequence xi superscript 2. Yeah? And now this, this other sequence is independent from the uh, previous sequence. So xi2 is independent from xj1. Yeah? Then, of course, I can combine these two. So actually, if the number of samples is different, yeah, then we have n1 plus n2 samples in total. And we have a sum from 
i equals one to n one plus n two. And we have say a sequence, which I call x i. Okay, so the sequence x i is either x i one for i being less or equal n one, or it's x i minus n one superscript two for i being larger than um, n one. Yeah? Then this is just the sum of i two uh, i one plus i two, where actually I have to adjust for the uh, numbers that are in front of the sums. So this is just multiplied with n one but now divided with n1 plus n2 plus n2 divided by n1 plus n2 times i2. Yeah? So this is just a very easy um, combination of two Monte Carlo approximations to get a better one. So maybe I need a little bit more space here. So let's uh, maybe move this here away. Yeah, so let's uh, delete it. Yeah, so I believe it's maybe clear. And let's move this one here. So if I draw a picture illustrating this, it means that for the Monte Carlo simulation, you have maybe one Monte Carlo integration here. So with a few sample points randomly chosen Okay, and then I have maybe another Monte Carlo integration here with some other sample points randomly chosen, so maybe just two. Yeah? But then I can combine these to a Monte Carlo integration Oops. With the union of these sample points. And this combination is, can be done very easily. Yeah, so uh, this is a nice property of the Monte Carlo method. If you now look at, say, a classical integration method like uh, Simpson's rule, yeah, okay, so for classical integration rules, this way of improving the result is far more complex. So Simpson's rule would discretize an interval, say, into odd and even points. So for example, if we just use um, five points, then we have here a coefficient of four. Here we have a coefficient of two before the sample point. And at the end, we have a coefficient of one. Okay, if you now would like to have a Simpson's rule with more discretization points, say here below, I would like to have more discretization points. So the points at the boundary, and maybe I would like to have, uh, yeah, this point and that point. Okay, then you immediately see that uh, 
it's not clear how to add something to achieve this improvement. Okay, so maybe in this example, you see that it's even totally unfair, yeah, because uh, the, the new discretization, the defined discretization, um, actually uh, uh, does not contain points which were, which were in the original discretization, yeah? So maybe it's, uh, it's not that fair. Um, but even if you have, for example, um, two discretizations uh, where the coarser one is a subset of the finer one, the additional discretization points do not form a Simpsons rule yeah? because you immediately see that you do not like to evaluate these guys. Okay. So it's not so clear how to combine two Simpsons rule to get an improved Simpsons rule. Okay, so um, you see that uh, this is a striking advantage of Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, you can improve two smaller ones to get one uh, bigger one, one better one. Yeah? And also, since we like coding, since we like to implement this, this is also an advantage from the implementation side because the independence of uh, the random variables tells us that the calculations we perform are independent. And if the calculations we perform are in, uh, independent, then this allows us to parallelize the calculations, for example, on multi-core uh, CPUs uh, or uh, graphic cards, GPUs. Um, so uh, this, is, this can be done uh, very easily to parallelize a Monte Carlo simulation. So you saw that the convergence rate in one dimension uh, is not very good compared to a classical integration rule. But since you can so easily perform parallelization on computers or graphic cards, maybe this eats up this uh, disadvantage. Going back to this picture, yeah, you see already here, It's the randomness, which makes this so easy. Yeah? So the second Monte Carlo simulation uses random points independent from the previous one. So the probability to hit a point that we used before is zero. Yeah? So it's an ILSAT. set. So actually on the computer, since we have discretized point, we have finitely many points, the probability is not zero, yeah? but actually here, yeah, so in, 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 in the um, continuum, uh, the, the randomness is not a bug, it's a feature, it is guaranteeing that we can add additional points. Yeah? So you already see uh, this uh, little thing that the, the randomness is maybe not a bug, it's a feature. Okay, so, um, more on this interpretation of how we should understand the, the method. Yeah? So, what I already mentioned is we have a probabilistic error estimate. So, the probability that our error stays below some uh, constant is larger than one minus delta. Uh, but we only have this in probability, and this is maybe a bit unsatisfactory, yeah? because uh, the error estimates holds only in a probabilistic sense. Yeah, so we have a theorem, but uh, we actually do not know uh, if it holds. So you might say that, okay, if this is the case, just use more um, Monte Carlo samples, yeah? just increase N. Yeah? So, but actually increasing N 
of course, does not change this property. It still holds in probabilistic, in the probabilistic sense. So what does it mean? What, uh, what is the impact of increasing n? So assume you perform two independent Monte Carlo drawings. Yeah, so like we just illustrated, then this can be either used, so for example, both have the same number, so we, we double the number of samples. Then this can be either used to improve the probability. So if you look here in this expression, you see that if you double n, you can redefine delta by delta half and have the same estimate. So if you double n, you can improve the probability from one minus delta to one minus delta half. Yeah? So you only have um, half the probability of failing uh, the uh, error estimate. Or you can uh, use n to improve the accuracy. Yeah? So if you here keep the same delta, but you move from n to 2n, this is like since there's square root since there's square root of n here, this is like improving the accuracy by a factor of one dividing, one divided by square root of n. So having more Monte Carlo samples either improves the probability of failing, yeah, so reduces the probability of failing, or it improves the accuracy but the result stays probabilistic. Okay, so. Um, there was one aspect when we compared the method to the Simpson's rule, which was maybe a little bit surprising. The um, dimension does not enter into the error estimate. Okay, so we talked uh, maybe a lot of this. So for Simpson's rule, you have that if you um, take a look at uh, the convergence rate in terms of how many function evaluations do we need, yeah, so this corresponds to the n here in the um, to the n here in the Monte Carlo error estimate. Yeah. Then for Simpson's rule, we saw that actually this uh, depends on uh, one second. Yeah. So this this depends on. Um, the dimension. Okay. But maybe another comparison here. So we saw here that actually we have an error estimate. We know all the constants here, but it only holds in probability. But if you take a look at the Simpson's error estimate, there's also here some constant in front. And this constant is related to say the variance of f. Yeah, it was the uh, fourth derivative of the function f that was inside this constant. And while actually this constant corresponds a little bit to the sigma term here. Yeah, so how does f change? Yeah, in many application, uh, it is that you re really do not know the constant. Yeah? Or it's maybe very hard to get the constant. If you have the fourth derivative of your function, then maybe you already know so much about the function that you could perform a better integration. 
So actually in practical applications, even classical integration rules have this problem that you know the convergence rate yeah, in terms of N, you know how you improve, but actually you do not know really the, the error bound. Yeah? So uh, this may be again as a remark on the probabilistic uh, nature of the error bound of the Monte Carlo um, uh, integral. Uh, you also have this kind of uncertainty also in classical integration rules if you do not know the constant which is in front. Of course, you know the convergence rate, but often n is also limited by, for example, the resources of your computer. Yeah? You cannot uh, really go to infinity with the n. Okay, so <clears throat> the most important advantage, and um, we already had this yesterday, is the difference in how the dimension enters into uh, the um, estimates. So for the Simpsons rule, uh, we had an error bound which is one divided by n to the power of four divided by the dimension. Yeah. And for the Monte Carlo integration, we have the error bound constant, which contains the variance and also the uh, uh, confidence level. Yeah. And this error bound is one divided by square root of n. Uh, and there's no d, no dependency of the dimension. Okay, so for very large dimensions, actually Monte Carlo will uh, pass yeah, so for example, for D larger than eight, Monte Carlo is more efficient than the Simpsons rule. Okay, so now you believe maybe eight dimensions, this is a big uh, integral, but uh, in mathematical finance, you very easily uh, reach uh, eight dimensions. So, um, for example, if you simulate an interest rate curve, uh, you have a curve of uh, interest rates for one year, two year, three year, 10 year, and every interest rate for every year is an independent, well, say more or less, or has some independent randomness inside. Yeah? So if you like to model some independence there, you have um, very easily, 10, if you have 10 years or 40, if you have 40 years um, of annual interest rates dimensions. Yeah? So we very easily re reach very high dimensions. Yeah? So 10, 40, 100 can be easily reached. And that's why Monte Carlo is a nice method uh, in this um, application. So this problem here is sometimes called a curse of dimension. Yeah? So uh, the curse of, of course, uh, with Simpson's rule. So Simpson's rule suffers from the curse of dimension where Monte Carlo does not suffer from this. Okay, so why does Simpson's rule suffer from the curse of dimension? Yeah, so if you take a look at the example d equals two, okay, then um, what you actually do is you write the double integral so you have an integral zero one in uh, say uh, two dimension, you write the double integral as an iterated one dimensional integral. Yeah, so we integrate say dx two and inside we integrate dx one And we use, say, um, n points for every inner integration 
and n points for every outer integration. So we use n times the inner integration, n times n is n squared. Yeah, so we have something like this. So we have a Cartesian product. Okay, so now, uh, how actually is it possible that the Monte Carlo method achieves this independence of the dimension? So this I would like to uh, discuss with you next. So, um, and I hope that my illustration gives you uh, some, some little deeper understanding or more intuition on how the Monte Carlo method works. Okay. So, Monte Carlo simulation or Monte Carlo integration converges at a rate which does not depend on the dimension. So, actually, how is this achieved? So, that is maybe the advantage. The disadvantage of our method was that the convergence result holds only in a probabilistic sense. And actually the point is that it is exactly this probabilistic nature which somehow achieves this independence of the dimension. And to illustrate this, I would like to take a look at a simplified example. So let's consider um, a function in two dimensions. So f maps 0, 1 squared to r. Okay, and we like to integrate this. So a classical integration rule achieves this by actually first integrating the function for fixed x2 with respect to x1. So x2 is fixed and we integrate with respect to x1. So let me draw this here. I fix some x2. So this here is x2. And then I integrate with some points here with respect to x1. This will give me then this value for that value of x2 of g. And then we integrate the function g with respect to x2. Yeah? So to integrate the function g with respect to x2, we have to have multiple values for g of x2. And if we use always the same integration rule, so if we use always the same integration algorithm for the inner rule, so if this is always the same, then actually this means that here the integration points which we choose for x1 are always the same. Yeah, so only the x2 part is different and the x1 part, the x1 points uh, are the same. Yeah, so on these lines, I always have the same value for x1. So in other words, I have a Cartesian product. Okay, so in other words, we have a Cartesian product of, uh, of discretization points. And the reason that we have a Cartesian product is because inside we always use the same uh, x1 discretization. So for every x2, use the same integration method, the same algorithm. Yeah, so the same algorithm means we have the same discretization points. Okay. So that's the setup for a classical integration method. 
And you see that uh, here I have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, let's add another one, then it's five by five, okay? So then we have 25, 25 discretization points. Okay, so N is five times five is 25. 25 discretization points, so it's five squared. Okay, so um, this is the picture from before. Actually, here I have four points, so it's four by four, yeah? so 16 points. And this is uh, the um, um, situation for our classical integration rules. These are the discretization points. So now um, in this situation, I would like to assume, say, a, a certain special, that we like to integrate a certain special function. And maybe this is a bit unfair, yeah, but maybe it's not unusually. And uh, unusual, the um, function which I like to integrate is f and assume that f does not depend on x2. So it does not depend on x2 or th say the dependence is very weakly. Yeah? So it's almost constant uh, if viewed as a function of um, x2. So this means f of x1 and x2 is equal or say say I, I take the second argument xc is equal to f of x1 and eta for all values of c and eta if only the x1 is the same. So this means that the function is constant along this line here. Okay, so that means for our little function g, yeah, so g was the in the function if I integrate along x1, that means the function g is constant. So now actually if I like to approximate a constant, the integral of a constant with Simpson's rule, uh, one point uh, would be enough, yeah? Uh, because uh, the uh, integral is just the constant times the size of the interval. Yeah? So actually the integration error of the constant in Simpson's rule is zero for any number of discretization points. So actually having here four discretization points in the vertical axis, is just a waste uh, of uh, calculation power. Put differently, what we are doing here is all the integration uh, rules on x1 use the same points. Yeah, so all these points here have the same values and uh, adding just four times the same value does not improve the accuracy. Okay, so actually from this example, you see that there's maybe a very simple uh, improvement um, to uh, have a better integration of this function. Yeah? And note that this situation is maybe not uh, uh, very uncommon, yeah? that you have a function which depends on multiple variables, but actually there's one variable which only influences the function very weakly or actually does not even uh, influence the function.
Okay, so a very simple improvement. So let's have an idea here. Idea, shift the x1 discretization a little bit. for every uh, x2. Yeah, so actually I would like to use my integration points x1 plus maybe a small shift, which depends on x2. Okay, let's have a picture. So this would look like this, yeah? So what does this mean? If you would use now an integration rule that uses these discretization points, and we have again, uh, sorry, oops. So, and we have again, that f does not depend on x2, then actually what do we use in the x1 component? We use 16 different discretization points or x1, yeah? So, this discretization of our interval, so interval was zero, one squared, has 16 different values for the x1 component. So this means integrating f Okay, f does not depend on x2. So f is actually a one-dimensional function. So a, a function depend, depending on a one-dimensional um, uh, uh, argument. So integrating f is like integrating a one-dimensional function and here, our one-dimensional integration uses 16 different points before it used four points. Yeah, so here we used four points. Now our discretization is a little bit better and we use 16 different points. So um, this has an improvement in the accuracy. And also if uh, in Simpsons will actually we have a power of four, uh, so actually this would uh, improve the um, accuracy by a factor of 256. Uh, yeah, so just by the small modification of the uh, discretization. Okay, but now actually you maybe already see the issue. I had a special choice for a function. Maybe it was not so special, but for this discretization here, there is another special choice of a function. So if 
uh, you assume that um, F is now constant along those lines. So if you consider um, F, so a function A function f being constant along the lines of this new discretization. So the lines of this new discretization is x1 plus our little shift a. By the way, a is 1 over 4. Yeah? So you see this here. So this is our shift A. Okay, so this is a line. So for every X2 uh, in R. So if now the function is constant along this line for each X1. Yeah, so it's not that F does not depend on X2, but F does not depend on where it is on this line. Yeah? Then we have the same situation as before. All integration rules give the same value. So actually the points uh, do not uh, differ and we just have four different integration points in this uh, axis, yeah, which crosses this, uh, these, these lines. So in the orthogonal direction. Um, okay, so This somewhat means that for every structure we have in our um, integration rule, I can give you maybe some function where the integration rule has some um, bad property here yeah, so that you see uh, the total number of integration points per dimension is the number of integration points you use to the power of one divided by the dimension. Yeah, so, um, exactly as we have it for the, the Simpsons rule. Okay, so how can we actually uh, get out of this? So, the issue here is that the discretization rule has a certain structure, and I can construct a function which also has this structure. And I can get out of this by using actually randomness. So if the function is given and I use a random sequence, then the probability that in every component I have the same point again is zero. So actually it's the randomness that fixes this. So for a Monte Carlo simulation, we use random discretization point and regardless of what projection you use, the randomness ensures that in every component or in every projection, you have a different value again. So the solution is actually to use the randomness. Huh? So if you go back to the example, the problem was that um, the function, so the, the initial example where the function did not depend on x2. Yeah? The problem was that for a new x2, we were using the same value for x1 in our integration rule. So, but when we add points using randomness, So when we add a random discretization point, so 
So we add a random discretization point, say x1, x2, say, this is an additional point, yeah. Then you have that every component is an IID sequence or IID random number. Then we add a new point in every component. Or put differently, the probability to to hit a discretization point So the projection of a discretization point on some axis, yeah, so the discretization points component, again, is zero. So for every component, for every individual component, so for every individual dimension, this holds, yeah, so every point in every dimension is performing a contribution in each dimension for every dimension or for every projection. Okay, so now you have understood why this randomness is actually breaking up this curse of dimension because every new sample vector, every new sample point, has a new contri a contribution on every component. Yeah? So if you look back to our initial example here, yeah? so then uh, you have that this sample point has a new contribution on X2, but this sample point does not have a new contribution for x1 because there was already a point which had this value in x1, okay? And that's why you have a new contribution in one dimension by this point, but you do not have a new contribution in other dimensions by this point. In the Monte Carlo simulation, every point is contribution in every dimension. So that's why, why it breaks up this curse of dimension. And you see that we achieve this explicitly by having this random nature. Okay, so conclusion. So the randomness is not a bug here. It's a feature. Okay, so that's nice. Uh, yeah, I, I hope this was uh, uh, was maybe giving you some some intuition. Uh, and actually, there will be more surprising stuff coming up, yeah, because um, it is maybe possible to achieve this property, yeah, but to some extent get rid of the probabilistic error estimate. Yeah. So now we have understood what's the property. The property is that we somehow can fill the space um, in a certain manner to actually contribute a new sampling in every possible uh, dimension or every possible aspect. Yeah, so that's maybe uh, the same idea here, the, the, the idea here. Okay, so 
that's uh, in the script just uh, the description of these uh, figures yeah so if you like to read it so uh, figure seven uh, was the case where we have the cartesian quid uh, then uh, figure eight was the case where we shifted the grid by uh, say this little shift here yeah and uh, then figure nine was the case where we had a function on the shifted grid which is also having the lack of accuracy and figure 10 was the Monte Carlo case yeah so that's just a description so you can read it later and that was just my remark that we uh, that we have some uh, stuff coming up uh, on um, improving this yeah so this is then motivating the definition of so-called low discrepancy sequences and there's also then a nice uh, theorem the uh, cox malafka inequality that uh, corresponds to the chebyshev formula okay so um Just a summary to finish now the section on Monte Carlo integration. Yeah, so the Monte Carlo integration has uh, several advantages. Yeah, so maybe don't forget about that one. The integration rule is very simple. Yeah, so even in higher dimensions, it's really easy to implement. It was just two lines of code. And this simplicity is also what it makes uh, easy to parallelize this. And if you have fast computers, yeah, maybe this is a, a much bigger advantage than uh, it looks uh, on, on, on first sight. Okay, it's very easy to implement. Then another um, advantage which we had today uh, in the beginning is that you can improve the accuracy just by adding more valuation points yeah so it's very easy to just improve the accuracy uh, just keep running add a little bit of points um, you can uh, you can you can look how the how the result improves for a classical integration rule actually if you divide your interval in n equidistributed intervals and you then you uh, add one point so you divide your interval into n plus one discretization points these are completely new points yeah so actually uh, increasing the number of points for a classical integration rule is uh, really not trivial and also it's uh, this uh, feature um, which uh, allows us to parallelize uh, the uh, method okay and well maybe the most uh, important thing here is um, that the convergence rate is independent of the dimension. So Monte Carlo integration is very suitable for high dimensional problems, which we have often in mathematical finance. <laughs>